So what I'm going to do is to talk about our reverse genetic systems, and then I will talk about uh, our work related to the reverse genetic system to use these systems to answer the real world questions. So when we first uh, work started to work on the uh, coronaviruses and uh, uh, we first uh, decided to make the reverse genetic system of the SARS-CoV-2. So we were the very first uh, one of the six labs receive uh, the viruses from the CDC colleagues. And what we did is follow the previously established uh, strategies to uh, use uh, the seven fragment of RT-PCR and then in vitro ligate those uh, seven fragment in the test tube. And then on the five prime, five prime end of the cDNA, we have engineered a T7 promoter. So we are able to in vitro transcribe the, the genomic mm -hmm. RNA. And then once we transfect into the cells, we're able to recover viruses as indicated here by the plaque assay. The recombinant virus uh, produced a plaque size very similar to the uh, original isolates uh, from the CDC. And then the system is very robust that will allow us to reproducibly to produce 10 to the seventh plaque forming unit per meal. And then once we establish the system, one of the first few things we did is to engineer the reporter virus. As indicated here on the left, we engineered uh, the luciferous, as I will show you later, or the green fluorescent protein, in this case, the amnion green, into the open reading frame seven of the viral genome. So we're able to recover the fluorescent uh, viruses and that will allow us to be very rapidly uh, to look at the antibody neutralizing activities as indicated on the uh, right. And the assay is very simple. On day zero, you see the 96 well plates. And then the next day, you mix your anti serum with the green fluorescent virus for one hour. And then you lay the complex onto the uh, preceded cell plates and 16 hours later, we use the high content imaging um, to quantify the green fluorescent uh, cells that are infected by the, the, the reporter virus. And in this way, we're very, uh, it will very quickly allow us to determine the neutralizing antibody titers in the serum. And using these assay, we collaborated with Pfizer and the BioNTech and to support their phase one, phase two, and the, the final approval of the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, as indicated here, the timeline is very uh, uh, tight uh, over, the, uh, over the, uh, the year and a half. And then uh, these are the, uh, some of the publications we used uh, to support their uh, neutralizing antibody uh, activities in the clinical trial. And the same platform, the reporter virus has been used by the Moderna and to look at their neutralizing antibody uh, after the vaccination of their vaccine. So this is just an example here, just showing you the three age groups over the six month period uh, that the decay of the neutralizing antibody uh, levels as it indicated here you know, there is a steady decay over the time after the two doses of their vaccination. But even after six months, there are still a substantial neutralizing activities as indicated here. And besides the fluorescent reporter viruses, we also engineered the luciferous into the virus, same at the OIF7. And then that allows us to use luciferous as a surrogate to um, to quantify the antiviral activities. This is particularly useful for high throughput drug screening. And using this platform, we are able to screen um, uh, the monoclonal antibodies derived from phage display libraries. And we initially identified uh, multiple uh, IgG antibodies using this assay. And then uh, 
after we identified the IgG, we've converted these IgG uh, antibodies into the IgM format. The rationale behind that is really the, the mucosal uh, uh, immunity. A lot of them is derived from the IgA and IgM, and we want to dip. And also the other reason is the IgM have five times more binding site. Uh, to bind to the spike proteins to block the viral infection. And then we were proposing that the IgM will allow us to do the nasal display of the, of the treatment that will be superior to the IV using the current IgG. So uh, once we converted the antibody IgG to the IgM, we found that in this case, the, the one of, you just use one example, the antibody 14, and the potency has increased uh, has in, has improved by more than 500 fold and the more remarkable observation is we found that the IgM antibody has a consistent activity across all the the variants later on we identified there is no compromise almost uh, of the activities against uh, the different variants why the IgG well, started to show some uh, 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 resistance. And also during the resistance selection, we also find uh, IgM has a, a very good advantages to overcome the resistance emergence. And we're very excited that this IgM uh, antibody has been licensed and we're in the process of the IND filing and move to the clinics. And one distinction, as I mentioned, is this will be uh, a nasal display. So and also another use uh, utility of the reverse genetic system is uh, illustrated here uh, through close collaboration with Pfizer and the BioNTech. We were closely monitoring the effect of the different new variants on the neutralizing antibodies uh, from the vaccinated individuals. And our approach uh, to tackle that question is unique in a couple of ways. First. We are always using the same 20 patient serum uh, from individuals who have been fully vaccinated using the current uh, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine regimen. Two doses, 30 microgram per dose. And then we have serum collected two weeks and four weeks after the vaccination. So it's the same set of 20 serum against all the variants we tested. And that will allow us to historically compare the relativeness of the neutralizing antibodies against the different variants over time. And the second uniqueness of our uh, platform is we use chimeric virus, authentic chimeric vir virus to monitor uh, the different variants as illustrated here on the left. So the top is the original virus, and for any variant, we use the reverse genetic system to swap the spike. So on the surface, the spike has completely swapped uh, to the different variants. Everything else is identical. So in this way, that clearly allows us to focus on the effect of the spike and their effect on the neutralizing activities. This is important because first, this is the authentic virus, the second is Really, the current uh, vaccine is only focusing on the spike. So now the data is summarized over here on the upright and the different variants. And uh, you can see among all the variants, the most concerning uh, is the, the beta, which is a South African variant. You can see the Y type, the, the, the geom geometric mean of the neutralizing level is five. 17, and then the, 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 the beta spike uh, reduces to 194. So there is a significant drop. And the others, including the delta, you see, there is not the dramatic, the drop of the neutralizing activity is not as dramatic as the beta. And even including the recent, the, the mu spike and the lambda spike, they all are not as dramatic as beta. So, these data clearly shows that the beta is uh, the beta variant is the most concerning one in terms of reducing the neutralizing activities. And again, uh, 
using the same chimeric viruses we were uh, uh, following uh, the neutralizing activity uh, waning of the from the individuals who vaccinated over the time so uh, this is the data we recently jointly published with Pfizer and the BioNTech and uh, i'm showing you here the two age groups of the waning of the neutralizing activities over time and then uh, after 8 and 2 months uh, post the second dose there is the third dose boost and then we're looking at their effect on the neutralizing antibody levels. So let's just focus on the left. There are different groups here. And the first group is before dose one. And these assays were all uh, uh, produced from the uh, plaque assay, plaque reduction neutralizing assay, the gold standard. And then this next group is uh, two days after dose two of the Pfizer vaccine. And you can see uh, robust neutralizing activities. For each group, uh, there are two color uh, uh, viruses being tested. One is the green, is the white type virus. And then the maroon represents the beta variant, which is the most concerning one, as I showed in my previous slides. So you can see that there is a difference between the Y type and, uh, and the, the, the beta variants. And then the next group is two or one month after the two dose, there is slightly drop. And then at 8.2 months after the second dose, you can see a significant waning of the neutralizing antibodies. And then after the third dose booster, you can clearly see, clearly see the, uh, the, the dramatic increase of the neutralizing antibodies. And then the other uh, remarkable observation is the differences of the boost between the Y type and uh, uh, the beta variants, uh, the differences uh, decreases compared with you know, the pre-boosting. So these data uh, clearly support the neutralizing, uh, uh, support the booster strategies of the vaccination, particularly after six months, after eight, eight months indicated here. And then the, the senior age group showed a very similar results. So besides the uh, infectious clone I showed you, uh, we used in the previous studies, and recently we also developed the BSL-2, uh, a reverse genetic system. Thus the current uh, challenge is working with the SARS-CoV-2 is and you need BSL-3. So to downgrade it to BSL-2, we used the transcomplementation system. In this system, we deleted two genes, as indicated here, of three and the envelope genes. And then we made a stable cell line that can be inducibly expressed those two missing genes. So if you have these RNA into these transcomplementing cells, you are able to produce authentic viruses. And then these viruses, in fact, the next a round of the a naive cells such as the Vero E6 cells, you are able to infect and translate and replicate the RNA, but they can no longer form the progeny viruses because uh, there are two genes are missing, the O3 and the E protein are missing, so they won't produce progeny viruses. And this a system because if it's a single round cycle and now we've got the approval from our institutional biosafety committee and the NIH that we can use this system to perform at the BSL2. So now I'm going to uh, tell you two stories of using uh, the reverse genetic system to uh, study the, the variants and their biology. So as we know, uh, the first predominant mutation in the variants is this D614G mutation in the spike gene. As it indicated here, early on in the spike at this position, it's all aspartic acid. And it's starting in February of last year, and there is detection of this D change to glycine. As time goes on, it became dominant in the uh, glycine at this position, uh, 614. So the question is, what's the biological function or impact of this mutation? And how does that affect the neutralizing activity of the vaccine? So to address these questions, 
Uh, we made isogenic pair of viruses. Uh, we mutated using the original virus, we mutated this D to G. Everything else are identical, except there is only this amino acid change in the spike. So then when we rep when we compare the replication kinetics of these viruses, you can see there is a slight increase in the color three cells uh, in uh, that the mutant virus has some advantages. And then we tested them in the hamster model. And you can see after intranasally infect the hamsters, both the, the, the Y type and the, the mutant virus showed uh, the infected animal showed weight loss and there is no significant differences here but when we measure the viral load in the upper respiratory tract the nasal wash and the trachea you can see the red represents the mutant virus is 10 times more viral load in the upper respiratory tract but in contrast in the lower respiratory tract indicated by the viral load in the different lobes of the lung and there is no difference. So indicating that this mutation specifically enhances the upper respiratory tract fitnesses of the viral replication in the animals. And then to confirm these results, we also tested them, this pair of viruses in the human primary airway culture. So you can see the red again is the mutant has advantages. And then you can see even when we do the competition assay when you infect the HAE cells one by one or one to one ratio the Y type and the mutant and the mutant virus wins the competition even when you change the inoculant the Y type to mutant nine to one the mutant virus still overcomes the the it wins the competition and these results clearly demonstrate that again the mutation has increases the fitnesses of the viruses. And then the current uh, mechanism uh, thinking behind that is this D2614G enhances uh, the conformation of the receptor binding domain in the open form, which is required um, to bind to the uh, S2 receptor of the cells. So by promoting this open conformation that allows the viruses to bind to the receptor more efficiently and therefore enhances the replication. So later on, we, we know that uh, there is this alpha variants and that uh, dominate uh, the, 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 the pandemic for a while around the world. And compared with original virus, there is eight extra mutations in the spike regions. So to investigate whether these eight mutations have effect on the viral replication of fitnesses, we made eight uh, individual mutants in the background of the D614G because they all have D614G. And we also made a eight X mutation. So that contains all these eight mutations in the spike or from the alpha, from the alpha variants. So uh, we, we recovered all these viruses and then through a hamster transmission experiment, we identify uh, the M501 uh, Y mutation is the dominant one that plays the critical role in this uh, enhanced fitnesses. So indicated here in the hamster, we mix the the, 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 the original white type virus with different mutants one to one to the hamster intranasally. And then on day one, we bring a clean a recipient hamster into the same cage and let the transmission to occur for eight hours. And then we separate them. And then we separate the donor animals and the recipient animals over the time to look at the viral load. The results are indicated here. The most critical mutation, the M501, you can see the donors over the, the nasal wash, there is uh, uh, anything over one, that means the 501 mutation has advantages. The recipient has, you can see the nasal wash also has advantages. And the donor, the trachea and the recipient trachea as, lo as, as well as the, the recipient, the lung, uh, the, the 501 mutation had mutant has uh, the advantages. 
So these data clearly indicates that the 501 mutation has advantages in transmission of the viruses. And in terms of mechanism, we performed the, the binding of the, the, the receptor binding domain versus the human S2, as you can see, the 501 mutation clearly uh, enhances the receptor binding. Uh, that might be the mechanism of this enhancement. So uh, finally, I would like to thank the uh, great collaborators and the team. And in, in the interest of the time, I'm not going to mention each of them. And I will stop here and thanks for your attention.